let's get started. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a personal one. Some of these were personal. I thought that was cool. Um, let's see. How about the? Do you have a favorite Old Testament story, and why is it your favorite? That's an easy personal question. Go ahead. What is Elijah? <laughs> the Battle of the Prophets of Baal. Ooh, that's a great story. Elijah, why, no, why is it your favorite? How do you answer that as a question? <laughs> no, the answer doesn't have to be okay. a question. Um, I love that story. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot of character in it. You have Elijah <clears throat> mocking um, idolaters. You have um, this battle between him alone against all of these false prophets. You see fire coming down, and it's just, it's full of fire, drama, excitement, like, and uh, that's always appealed to me. Plus just the, I don't know, a big part of my own conversion and salvation was um, being a part of seeing God do amazing things. So reading that story is a great affirmation that, that God does amazing things that cannot be done in ordinary ways. It also has one of the best jokes in the whole Bible. It does. It does. It does. Yeah. When Elijah mocks yeah. Baal by saying, what is he going to the bathroom? Is he oh, relieving himself. <laughs> It's a great yeah. taking selfies. The Bible's fun. <laughs> selfies. That's, yeah. Dave, Joe, what about you? I gotta hear Dave's first. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, obviously, Zechariah three has the gospel. Uh, Isaiah six. Isaiah is willing to go without knowing where. But I gotta say, my favorite comes from Judges three. Uh, Ehud. Oh. I was gonna say that. That's funny. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a bad king, Eglon, and uh, so Ehud makes his sword, and he hides it, and he goes up and he gets the guards to leave, and then he sticks it in the belly of the bad king, and it says that his fat just rolled over it and hid the knife, and that he relieved himself, and so... The uh, Ehud sneaks out the, the window, and so the guards are at the door, and they wait, and they wait, and they think he's going to the bathroom, and I'm sure it's because the smell's coming underneath the door. <laughs> and, and anyway, it gives them enough time to get away, and they go in there, and they find out he's dead. And, and the, the, the reason I like it, too, is because even the people that God uses, they're not perfect. Okay, he was a sneak the way he did that. And I think what he did might have been a good thing, but he was pretty sneaky about it. And yet God uses us even in our imperfections. That's the most Pastor Dave story ever. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, he stole yours. That he was did, yours he, he, as, stole, as well. he stole mine. Is mm -hmm. this on? Uh, it kind of is. It kind of yeah. is. Okay. I've had the worst trouble with mics <laughs> recently. I, they're demon-possessed, I think. But. Um, I guess my second favorite Old Testament story is uh, one I'm getting ready to actually preach through in the next, over in September. So that's the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph, of course, has the, the coat of many colors, but my favorite part of that story is the end, when his brothers come back to him and they think that he's going to kill them because they've sold him off into slavery and he's had to go through all these ordeals and suffering. And um, he, he looks at them and says, what well, you intended for evil, God intended for good, so that many would be saved. And so that's one of my favorite stories because oftentimes, and, and you'll hear this in, in the messages coming up in September, is, is God uses our suffering. God uses those difficulties in our lives. And um, we'll, we'll talk about forgiveness and other things as well, but that's, that's my second favorite. But Dave, Dave and I think a lot alike, which is scary. <laughs> it is scary. <laughs> Uh, mine is uh, Elisha and the two she bears. That uh, <laughs> when the youth come up to Elisha and call him bald, and Elisha yeah. commands two bears to maul the the youth that make fun of him alive. Just saying. <laughs> 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 Say what? Yeah. Not all you're gonna do is no, I, I, I'm not saying I can do that. I'm not a prophet. Go up, you old bald head. Oh, all right. Here's another one that's uh, that's a personal question. How did you meet your wives? How did you meet your wives? And there, there's some follow-up to that as well. So well, let me answer that first. How did you meet your wives? My wife came to work at an office I was at as a secretary. And I thought she was attractive, but I paid no attention to her. 
She had red hair, and one day she got mad at one of the other, one of the people that came into the office. It was a probation office. And she slammed that desk drawer, and I went, oh. <laughs> that girl's got fire. And that was how I was attracted to it. Um, that's awesome. Oh, my turn went off. So I met Claudia at the University of Florida, um, which is one of the reasons why it is the best university in the nation. Some might even say in the world. Just throwing it out there. I've heard that said before. Um, but so we, uh, we attended a college group called Chi Alpha. It was a college ministry on a campus there. Um, the first time I saw her, I, I can describe to you the outfit that she was wearing. Now, if you ask her the story, she will say that she never owned those items of clothing. But I know what I saw, and that image will always be in my mind, true or not. Um, but uh, we met at Chi Alpha at University of Florida. I was a sophomore, she was a freshman. And, um, Beyond her, her beauty and her um, passion in her life, she also was very zealous for the Lord in a way that made me question if I was actually able to lead her and be a qualified suitor for her. Um, and that really challenged me and caught my attention. So, yeah. so I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was oh, going to say they're, they're white capri pants that she doesn't own. White capri pants? She doesn't own those, though. But she was wearing them that night. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember what Danny was wearing when I first met her. I just remember the, the aura around her, and the, the, the angelic music. And so we, we met at we met at probably the, the second the second best university in the world, uh, University of Mobile. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard of that. It's a small Baptist college in South Alabama. But uh, we, we had classes together. Both of us were pursuing um, a degree in theology at the time. And so uh, we were study partners. And just so you guys kind of know a little bit of, of, of the background uh, and why, the, why this is important, I wasn't saved until I was 23. So I, went, I w was called to the ministry shortly thereafter and then left the university that I was attending and transferred to University of Mobile, which I met Danny my first semester there. But uh, we, we didn't, she had another love interest at the time. And so I had, I had resigned myself to singleness um, at, that particular, at that particular point because I did get saved when I was 23. So I did a lot of stupid things when I was um, a teenager and a young adult. So I'll, I'll just confess that to you. So I had resigned myself to singleness and said, okay, Lord, if you want me to be married, then you have to bring me a woman uh, because I'm not pursuing one. And, and I, didn't, I didn't pursue her actually. And uh, we, we ended up in a German class together. We, I had to take two years of German in one year. And she had to take one year in one semester. So that, that was kind of the way we, and we sat next to each other and we started talking and passing notes in uh, German class. And so, you know, the only thing I remember from German class is Ich liebe dich, which is I love you. So. Aww. Aww. That's a sweet story. Does Danny speak German now? <laughs> so here's the follow-up to, to that question. <laughs> here's the follow-up to that question, and, and maybe you kind of answered some of it in, in your stories there, but um, were you or your wives Christians when you met? And then kind of the, the wisdom you can kind of bring here is, how can someone know whether someone else is a believer? Like if you're, if you know someone, maybe just a friend, or even if you're attracted to them, how can you know that they're a believer or not? So I'll go first. Um, yes, Danny and I both were believers at the time. Both of us were saved later than teenagers. So she, she was saved um, in her 20s as well. And so how can you know if somebody's a believer? Well, it, it's real easy when you're attracted to somebody, it's real easy to say, oh yeah, that person's definitely a believer. <clears throat> and, and there are and there are young men and young women who will pretend to be believers in order to get that relationship that they want with that person who is a professing believer. So you have to be careful. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is that's that's known over the long haul, uh, not the short run. So somebody that just makes a profession of faith because now all of a sudden they're in love or they're they're interested in a relationship, you have to be really careful about. So here's the wise thing to do. You have people around you who are older than you and older in the faith. Ask that person and say, do you think that person's a genuine believer? Do you think they're mature enough in the faith to have a relationship at this point? 
Um, you can you can ask my wife if she were if she were here right now and answering this question, she would tell you there were a lot of young men who pretended to be believers and they were part of single groups and uh, you know young adult groups at churches just to get dates. And so, not that men would ever be deceptive. I mean, certainly that never <laughs> happens. But um, and, and then you go on a date with them and you find out that they're not really a Christian after all. So uh, that it's better to really start off as friends and see if that person is genuinely uh, a believer. Uh, give it time and uh, see, see what happens. Ask those who are wiser in the faith than you are. Um, I, I, did that, I did that with Danny. I, I went to people who were older than me and said, am I doing the right thing here? So we all need counselors. Well, I could just restate everything Joe said, but I get one thing in addition to that, I guess, would be... Um, does the person challenge you spiritually is a really big one, I think. Um, if you, if everything spiritual in the interaction, the relationship always seems to be coming from one direction, um, that might be an indication that the person is not pursuing the Lord on their own, but rather they're just keeping up with you to be around you. It doesn't have to be a deal breaker. Doesn't mean maybe they could be just less mature than you spiritually, but that would be something that I would be mindful of. If it seems like they're always playing catch up with me spiritually or following me spiritually, they're not actually having anything on their own spiritually, that would be a big <clears throat> flag to consider. But I think Joe's comment, particularly about involving others around you, is, is probably the best, best answer to that question. I, I thought I was a Christian, and my wife was, but uh, I found out later that I wasn't. And uh, I said prayers, I. Uh, still live the way I wanted to live. And so, it, it act, my faith came much later, but uh, almost cost my marriage, in fact. But then the Lord, through trials, as you preach today, brought me to a point that I gave up and gave myself to Him. And, and then I became a believer. And by that time, I had almost ruined the marriage but God healed that, and that was as part of his blessing. And the other thing I would add to what they've already said is just in a very subtle way, ask them, uh, you know, that, that one of those questions you learn uh, when you're presenting the gospel is, if you died, would you go to heaven, and, and why? Why would God let you into heaven? And if they talk about, I'm a good person, stuff like that, they're not a believer. It has to be that Jesus, because I believe in Jesus, he died for me and took away my sins. <clears throat> you stole my answer, which was going to be give them the gospel. Give them the gospel and see what happens. Yeah. All right, here's the next question. Bible question. Let's get, let's get into some Bible questions. How can we trust that what the Bible says is really true? I thought that was a really good one. How can we trust that what the Bible says is really true? I'm going to let my chauffeur answer this one. It's so easy. Why am I going to try? I just can't remember if it's 1st or 2nd Timothy 3.16. 1st Timothy 3.16? 1st Timothy 3.16. Yeah. 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 All scripture is God breathed. I mean, how can you argue with that? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> And scripture does tell us that it's, it's from him. I think one of the things that I found really helpful is that there is no better mirror to who we are, the world we live in is, than what we find in scripture. It describes the sin, the challenges, the joy. It describes the world so accurately from the inner life that we have internally to what's going on in our relationships to the world around us. And there's a lot of affirmation that this is correct as we read it and look at the world and see its truth reflected in, in every facet of it. Um, so... That's affirming. That isn't the reason why I believe it's true, but that's very affirming. The reason why I believe it's true is because God has saved me, transformed my heart, opened my eyes, so when I look at this book and when I read it, I hear his voice and see his truth in it. And ultimately, that's how I know because he's saved me. Um, but there are a lot of things that affirm that as well. Yeah, I, I would add to that, you know, our confession, the, the Westminster Confession, talks a lot about this in the very first chapter of the confession, which is of the Holy Scriptures. And so there's a lot of things about the Bible that are self-attesting. I mean, there's, there's the beauty of it, 
You've got, you've got a book that's written over a period of about 1,500 years by about 40-something different authors, and the message is the same all the way through Scripture. And, and I hope one of the things that you're able to see as, as the sermons are being preached, as, you're, as John is teaching you and, and others, is how the Bible fits together, Old Testament and New Testament together. And so that's one of the proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. Somebody who didn't even know the other person wrote in a way that's very similar to the other, and the same message uh, just permeates the Scripture all the way through. But as Anthony just said, you know, the, the main reason you know that the Bible is the Word of God is because you've been converted. Uh, you've been changed. The Holy Spirit resides within you. And when the Holy Spirit speaks in the Scripture, the Holy Spirit within you recognizes that as the Word of God, and it, it resonates with your heart. The biggest problem that most people have with the Bible is they never read the Bible. If you read the Bible, I promise you, you would come to the conclusion this is the word of God, especially if you read it with a heart that's open, because the Bible reads us. And, and I can kind of tell you my own conversion story real quick. I didn't, I didn't know if the Bible was true or not. Um, January the 1st of 1996, I was 22 years old. I sat on my mom and dad's front porch. I had no direction, no purpose for my life. And I thought, you know what? I probably should read the Bible. I don't know where the thought like that comes from other than the Lord. And, and he's leading me and calling me. And so I, I went on January the 2nd. I, I drove my, my truck down to a place where I could, I could read in private because I didn't want anybody to know I was reading the scripture. And so I read completely through the scripture. And in September, I was reading through again. And that's when I was converted. Um, I understood for the first time that Christ was my only hope, that I was a sinner. The Bible made that very clear, and, I, and it resonated with my heart, and I knew that was my only hope. And so I have never once doubted the Scripture since that moment of conversion. And so I put the Scripture to the test, and it actually tested me. Thank you for your sermon. I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult for me. I, I have a hard time pronouncing some of the names. And uh, uh, I'd like to hear how all four of you feel about that. <laughs> go ahead. I will go first. Um, so I had a one of my mentors when I came to interesting passages like genealogies or things in Leviticus that just kind of seemed to go on and on and hard to, sign, to find the value in it. He would always say, Anthony, there's still meat on those bones. And his point with that was if you keep gnawing and keep chewing, there are, there are reasons God has put those things there for us. I know we didn't get to save it because we had like a, an IT issue, the, the, the Sunday that Joe preached his candidate sermon, but it was on actually that passage in Matthew. And you did an awesome thing, um, exposition of, of those names, showing us how all of those things are actually is drawing a picture, it's painting a picture of how Christ is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. Now on the surface, when you read that, you just see names. They're weird names, they're awkward names. Like, okay, can we skip past the names and get to the story? Um, but there are certain things like those genealogies, like maybe more obscure, hard passages that if we're able to take the time and dig in and study, there are things in there, there's meat on those bones for us to come and be blown away by God's beauty, by his wisdom, by how he with these obscure things is actually connecting and drawing strings and lines of truth and, um, and fulfillment and prophecy through the entire Bible. But sometimes to find those things, we really have to be chewing and gnawing on them to see what's going on there. So uh, if the difficulty is just the names, my solution to that is get a Bible app on your phone, just play the app and let it read it to you. Oh, that's how you say it. That's very helpful. Max McLean is an awesome Bible reader. He reads the ESV Bible app. So I just play and listen to how they say all the names. It's very helpful for me. If it's understanding why this is here and the value of it and the value of this text, part of that is you ask people around you and you actually study and gnaw on that, that passage until you, uh, you get what you're looking for, which is God. I want us to understand why you have this here for me. And there is a there's a reason why, but it's not always going to be at that first look or first pass. I, I agree with Anthony, and then I think it was back to what Joe just said was, "This is God's word; He put it there." And you don't understand sometimes why He did what He did, why He does what He does, why He wrote this in this in this in this Bible. And yet, that's where the trust in our heart to know that he is God. 
He has given this as a guide for our life. So every part of it is useful. There's, there's hard passages in the scripture and our tendency is to want to skip over the hard things. Uh, is it easier for me to read about some guy hiding his knife and sticking it in somebody's belly and then escaping and the guards thinking he was going to the bathroom? Yeah, it's a lot easier than to go through the list of names. But that's just because me and I'm, I'm it's hard for me sometimes to go through that, but I got to stop and say, God wrote this for me to read and to, and to try to understand. And, and I would say, if you come across that name, I mean that that's a great way to do it is to to do the app. But if you don't have the app, just do what I do and just pronounce it like you live in South Alabama, because <laughs> that's the way most people pronounce it, right? I mean, so you you can try to try to enunciate the Hebrew and the Greek names if you want to, but it really doesn't do anybody any good. So, you know, it, whatever whatever you can read there, you you can read. So, uh, have you guys seen that name? And he's in he's in Colossians, and he's in uh, he's also What's in Philemon. Um, it, it's spelled T Y C H I C U S. It looks like Tychicus. <laughs> It look, it's not how it's pronounced. How do, how do you say it, Anthony? How do you say it? I'm going to say Tychicus from it's, now on. It's not. <laughs> it, it's not. Uh, it, it, it's yeah. just my boy. It, it's, 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 his, his name, it, it, if some, some of you will remember this because you're older. Um, there was a man who ran for president whose name was Michael Dukakis. Okay, that was his name. And so it's pronounced the, the, exactly the same way as Michael Dukakis' name, who was a politician. It's Dukakis. That's how you say it. It doesn't look anything like that in English. <laughs> so, I mean, how am I supposed to know that if I don't know Greek? And so you just pronounce it however you want to pronounce it and move on. Uh, give it a different name. Uh, that's Thomas there. You know. <laughs> my, my only advice would be uh, if... Uh, if you have a study Bible, or if you don't have a study Bible, get like an ESV study. It's the simplest, short of like going and buying like a bunch of commentaries and stuff like that. Get a study Bible because what it helps you do is to be able to learn very quickly. Oh, okay, there's a there's a simple explanation. It might not be the deepest explanation, but it'd be a simple explanation of this passage or that passage. And then my, my other piece of advice is this: when I was in high school. I did not know. I, ha I wrote so many questions in the margins of my Bible, and Pastor Dave knows that because I, I would I constantly be asking him questions. Because I just didn't know. I was like, "What does this mean? Why? Huh? What?" And I'd be like constantly writing down questions. And what I did as the years went by is I'd go through and answer them. And so, just you're not going to know everything right away. That that's the whole point. And uh, even Mr. Vic, you know, he's been reading the Bible for a long, lot longer than all of us. And, and there's still going to be questions, you know, as, as you read the Bible. So give it time as well. Um, here's the next one. Does God really love everyone? Yeah, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, guess, I guess I'll jump in. I, I'm, I'll jump in. It's up to you. The answer to that question is yes. God really does love everyone. and this, But then the op other question is, does he love everyone equally? And the answer to that question is no. And then the other question is, there are there people that God has loved and now hates? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, so we, we need to remember this when we talk about God loving people. God God has a general love for all mankind. One of the reasons that God has a general love for all mankind is because we bear his image. He can love his image within us. He can love us in a general way. But oftentimes when people are saying, does God love everyone? What he means by what they mean by that is, does God love everyone enough to save everyone? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, we, we have to confess that because that's what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches us that God has set his love upon his elect. He set his love upon those whom he saves. And he and he's loved them for all of eternity. So when we think about the eternality of God, and we think about God's love, when God loves us, God never started to love us. God has always loved us, just as he is eternal. Even before we existed, 
Uh, even before our parents existed, before the world existed, God loved his people and he pours out his love on his people in time. And so I know we wrestle with that. Is that, is that fair? Is it, is it right that God loves some in a salvific way and he doesn't love others in a salvific way? Well, you, you think about this just for a minute. At, one, at some point in your life, you're going to marry someone. More than likely, that's the normal pattern for everybody. Some people have the gift of singleness. I think very few people do. Most people, the, the pattern of life is you, you grow up, you get married, you marry someone. When you marry someone in our society, you have a choice, right? You, your parents are not arranging your marriages. So you say yes and no. And, and for those of us that are parents, we wish that we could arrange marriages for our children, but it typically doesn't work that way. You, you have an opportunity there to say yes or no, but when you decide, yes, I'm going to marry that person, you are setting your love upon that person. You are promising to give yourself to that person and love that person till death do you part. That's what your vows say. And so that's easy and sometimes it's hard, but that's the vows. And so we all think, well, we have a choice in who we love. Why does God not have a choice? And God has, a, God has the greater choice. Because he's God and everything he does is perfect every single time. So when we, when we ask the question, does God love everybody? The answer to that question is yes in a general way, but no when it comes to salvation. The Bible is very clear. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. The Bible says that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when we read the scripture, we have to say, yes, God does love people generally. He loves specific people savingly. And then there are others that he hates. You want us all to chime in? If you want. You don't have to. It's you correct me anything I got wrong. <laughs> so the real answer, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Joe. Um, <laughs> and then they will uh, certainly quote that. Uh, this is a hard question. This is one of the questions I wrestle with. Because, for example, when a young man asks a young girl if she loves him, and she responds with, of course I love you. You're my best friend ever. <laughs> that is not what he's asking. Is that right? <laughs> when we ask the question, does God love everyone? The question isn't, does God have a general affection or a commitment for everyone? We're asking a very specific question. Does he love everyone? Kind of with that passionate, strong, saving love. And everything Joe said was, was correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with it. But um, it's a hard question. I think what has been helpful for me to wrestle with that question, um, I think maybe, maybe John Owen, is how he breaks it down, but the idea that God loves all of his creation. We see that in the, in the parables even, in, in the Jesus' teaching. He cares for the lilies of the field. He, he cares for the birds in the sky. He loves all of his creation. But more than he loves all of his creation, he loves his creation that's made in his image. So he loves his creation, but more than he loves the flowers and the animals and the plants and the mountains, he loves his image bearers. But more than he loves his image bearers generally, he loves those who he has especially set his affection upon for salvation, the elect, um, the believers, the church. But even more than he loves them especially, he loves his son more than even them. And I think when you see that layers in there. It, it doesn't take away the sting of the difficulty of the question, but it does kind of put it in a framework. That, okay, I can see that. I can see how God, how we can say God loves, but we can mean that in different ways as we talk about it. Yes, God, God, loves, God loves the birds in the air, but we all have no problem admitting that he loves those who bear his image more than that. Um, and it was all the way up. So I find that helpful. Um, but it is a hard question because when I I can affirm the truth, God loves everyone. I can say that. But I know when people ask me that question, they're not always asking it the same way I'm affirming it. And I think the best thing is just to be honest with that and say yes. And the, and the pushback is, well, that's not fair because that means you're telling me that someone, like God wouldn't love someone who wants to be a Christian. God, what if someone wanted it? God didn't give them a chance. But the scripture never teaches us that God doesn't give people a chance. It says that we don't even want a chance unless he does something in us first. There is not a person who would want to love God and know God and follow God who he will ever turn away. 
but all those who call upon his name, they shall be saved. And all those who call upon his name have the fullness of his love upon them. It's a hard question. That's a good one. The, uh, the only thing I would uh, add is just a reminder that when you hear that question, if, if, you, if the thought of God <clears throat> hating someone seems unfair, and you brought up the issue of fairness, Joe, um, keep in mind that it, it can seem unfair, but if you look at it the right way, it should seem kind of incredible. Because it seems unfair if you start with the assumption, well, everyone's basically good. And therefore, God should love everyone. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all, right? So if you start with that assumption, then yeah, it seems unfair. But if you start with the correct assumption, which was what Anthony was getting at, is that we're not inherently good. We're inherently bad, yeah, right? We, we inherently uh, deserve the wrath of God, right? In fact, the Bible even says that all of us were under the wrath of God before Christ, right? And so if that's true, then it's incredible that God loves anyone. And that, that's the correct way to look at it. It's incredible that God would love anybody. You know, uh, so the, it, it is a tough question. Though. Yeah. It's a tough, it's a good one. Thank you guys for asking. Um, so a follow up to that, that I think goes really well. What happens to someone if they die without ever hearing about Jesus or being told the gospel? Do they go to hell? Does God give them a second chance? Has everyone in the world already heard about Jesus? Dave didn't get to answer the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the fact is that we don't know how God works in some people's hearts. There's a lot of stories of missionaries that were killed. And uh, one in particular, I remember here in the seminary, I don't know if it's true or not, but he got killed in the river. As he's crossing the river to get to the land that he had studied and prepared for, he learned their language and he was going to bring them the gospel, and he died. And uh, years later, other missionaries went to that, that land and they found churches because the work he had prepared and translated the, the scripture into their language, they found and they read and God worked in their hearts somehow to make them believe. So the thing to remember is that if, if God can save who he will save, he, he does save who he is elected. And therefore, uh, John the Baptist before he was even born, recognized Christ. So God had worked his spirit in this baby, still in his mother's womb, and brought him to faith that he recognized Christ when Mary went to him. And, and it was just pregnant with Jesus. So, uh, now you, you let, me, let me rephrase the question rather than, than answer. Without repenting and believing in Christ, you will go to hell. But God works. If he, if he doesn't work through us, we're instructed to take that gospel to the ends of the world. And if we don't get to somebody that God has chosen, he will say, save them in a way that is extraordinary. small tribe in the forest somewhere that no missionary has gone to yet. If they, if they die without being told the gospel. Right. So the Bible is really clear. Um, there is no salvation outside of Jesus. 
There is no way for someone to be forgiven, to have their sins washed and cleansed, to be on a right standing with God, apart from declaring that Jesus is Lord and repenting and believing in Him. Um, the ordinary way that people have the opportunity to do that is through hearing the gospel being declared to them. Um, so the short answer is, if someone has never repented of their sins and trusted in Christ, there is no salvation for that person. Now this question, again, wrestles with that issue of fairness, which, without having to restate it all, going back to what you said in the last question, John, it assumes that people deserve or are entitled to something from God other than His wrath. The scripture makes it clear that no one is entitled to anything other than um, than his wrath, but in his mercy and grace he extends salvation to some. But it also assumes that there are people who are innocent. There are people somewhere who, if God just gave them a chance, they would have repented. The scripture is clear. No one is good, not one. When you read through Romans 1 and 2, it gives this picture of you have the Jews who have the law given, they've been given literally everything. I mean, given everything from God, and having the law in their hands, having it memorized, they still sin and rebel against Him. And then Paul gives the other extreme. There are those who do not have the law, the word given to them, but they know what's right and wrong because it's been written into their conscience. They are image bearers of God, and part of what being an image bearer of God means is that you have a general sense of what is right and what is wrong. And even, though, and even those who haven't heard the gospel, those people are still in rebellion, even against what they know to be right. There is no one sin. There is no one innocent. Um, so all deserve God's wrath and judgment. And the response for us is what Pastor Dave was kind of sharing at. And there is, if we are concerned for those who have not heard, we can go to them with the gospel. And there is not a person who would hear the gospel and repent who will not be given an opportunity to hear the gospel and repent. There is no one who is going to hell who is just waiting for God to finally get out to them, but time ran out. Every single person who would call on his name and repent will have the chance to do so. There was a last part to that question, too. What was, what was the last part of that question? Has everyone in the world already heard about Jesus? No. Everyone in the world has not heard about Jesus. I want you to think about this. We, we were talking about the love of God. We were talking about the gospel spreading. We were talking about, you know, whether or not God loves everyone equally. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Jesus died on the cross somewhere around 33 AD. The last apostle died probably, if John, if, if history is correct, probably around 90, 95 AD, something like that. So we're, we're talking about 60 to 62 years after the death of Christ, John the Apostle dies. There were people who lived and died in Central, South, and what is North America today. Asia, parts of Africa that never heard the name of Jesus in the days of Jesus and the Apostles. There were people who lived in South America, Central America, North America, same places in parts of Africa, parts of Asia, who never received the gospel until the 1700s and 1800s. If, if you would have been born where you were born, if you, if you were born here in the state of Florida, if you were born 600 years ago, you would have lived your entire life and you would have never heard the name Jesus. And the reason you would have never heard the name Jesus is because there were no missionaries here. There was nobody here to bring the gospel. Uh, people hadn't crossed the ocean yet and with ships and missionaries and things like that. Dan the travel was dangerous. So you think about the amount of grace that you've received just as a person who lives in this county, who's sitting in this room tonight, who can hear the gospel freely. And you've probably heard it thousands of times in your life at this point. And yet there are untold numbers of millions and maybe even billions of people who have lived their lives and never once heard the name of Jesus. The grace and mercy that we have received as, as people in the days that we live in is 
is unimaginable if you think about it just for a moment. And what Anthony said is right, what David said is right. If we're that concerned, and we should be, we should be burdened. We should be burdened that there are people who live in this world today with the technology that we have who, who will live and die and never hear the name of Jesus. So I think that's a great question that whoever asked that question, because it should put a burning in your heart to make sure that not just people that may never hear, but what about your neighbor? What about your friend at school? What about your brother or sister at home? What about your mother or father, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles? Reach the ones that you can reach with the gospel right now. John, how did you come to youth group? Someone invited me. That's right. Uh, time for two more. I say we do two more and we're done. Okay, and they're, they're both really interesting. Here we go. This, this was the relationship question. We all know that sex before marriage is bad. Why is it bad? Where does the Bible say it's bad? Sex is the sign and the seal of the covenant of marriage. If you look at scripture, God made his covenant with Abraham. And it's a sign that you became a part of God's family. Uh, the sign of that covenant was circumcision for the, the young boy, babies, eight days old. And that stayed until Jesus then gave us the sign as baptizing, which baptism is now the sign of the covenant. If you look at the at the covenant, what, what do we do in communion? That's a sign and a seal. When you're making, when you're getting married, you're making a covenant with that person. And the Lord takes the two, it says in Ephesians, and he makes the two one. And the sign of that covenant is sex. So if you have sex prior to making that covenant, that's why it's wrong. Somebody else take a go at it. Get your Bible open. Go ahead. I'm still trying to find the verse. All right, I want to talk about I want to talk about cars. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm embarrassed to talk about sex because I'm not because everything Dave said was was true. But I want you to think about cars just for a minute. Anybody like cars? Okay. So if you were to go into my office and any of you are welcome to go in there, the door's always open. You look at my pictures and my grandson's up there and then I've got a picture of my first car up there. It was a 1971 Mustang. And it's Corvette yellow. It was, it was painted Corvette yellow. My dad and mom got it for me when I was 15. And, and really and truthfully, the reason my dad got this, and, and I hope he won't hear this, but um, the reason my dad got this is because he was going through a second childhood at that point, and he wanted it. <laughs> so he gave it to me, which was a big mistake. So the man who built the engine in the car built race car engines. So th that'll tell you exactly why I didn't need to have this car when I was 15 years old. So I got my driver's license at 16. We had it painted, and I was coming home from work one night, and it was a, it was a 302. It, had, it, it was cammed out, man. It, it was a manual transmission. This thing would fly. And so I was goofing off and not doing the right thing, and I was spinning the tires. I mean, I, I, I left out first gear, second gear, third gear. Man, I was spinning all the way through that, and I lost control of it. And I ended up crashing that car into a ditch head on. I mean, just head on in the ditch, just crumpled the front end of that car, spun around, hit a mailbox pole that was metal, the mailbox pole, mailbox went flying, the mailbox pole went through the side of the car. I'm holding on to the I'm holding on to the steering wheel like crazy because I didn't even have the seat belts back in this car at this time. So I'm trying not to fly through the, the passenger window as I, as this car is finally coming to a stop. And so I tell you that to tell you this. That car was built not to do that. That car was built to drive on the road according to the speed limit, according to the law. And there are places where I could take that car that I could do those kind of things. Racetracks, 
drag strips, uh, open fields, you know, th those kind of things that were designed and made to take a car to its mechanical limits. And so driving that car outside of the law, not according to what the law is, cost me a car. And it could have cost me my life. And so it's the same thing with what God has designed for sex and marriage. So yeah, can you have sex outside of marriage? People do it all the time. Is it right? No, the Ten Commandments still stand, right? Do not commit adultery. Adultery has not just with, between people who are already married and going outside of that, but also those that are protecting that sign and seal of that covenant. And so God has designed his law not to keep us from joy, but to provide joy for us. And so sex within the context of a marriage between a between one man and one woman for life is an absolutely beautiful, wonderful thing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. And it produces children. And so you get into trouble when you have sex outside of that covenant bond and that, that marriage because you've got to go home and tell your parents that you're pregnant or you've got somebody pregnant. And so you've broken the law and therefore there are penalties and, and problems as a result of that. Within the marriage, it's wonderful. It's beautiful, and it's what God has designed. So when you were young, they didn't have seatbelts in cars yet? Yeah, they did, but I didn't put them back in. Oh, yeah, that was okay. the problem. I was stuck on that little yeah, I, I just, I just Yeah, I just finished the interior. Okay. Yeah, they, they just didn't have a back seatbelt. <laughs> yeah, we didn't, we didn't have to back to the how old are you question again <laughs> quick. <laughs> no, the um, car was older than me. Um... So I think part of the question was, is it bad, right? That was one of the questions as well. Hey, just, why is it bad? Well, why is it bad? Well, I was going to read the verse that said it was bad. Okay, go ahead. Um, I guess I'll still do that. Yes. Yeah, let me just read it. I mean, we are pastors talking about truth. So um, 1 Corinthians 6, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? With whom, with whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now you might be paused. Well, we aren't talking about prostitution. Um, but the reasons he gives here for not sleeping with a prostitute are grounded in the fact that when you are sexually intimate with someone, you join yourself to them. And the body is your sexual um, purity. Your body is not for you alone, but it is meant to be given to the one who you will be one flesh with. You will be united to in marriage. Um, so there's a, a scripture for why it's bad and says it's bad. But another thing interesting is that... Um, you don't make the comment to everyone. Well, it's common now. It's almost like waiting to marriage is, is, is an old school traditional thing. And it's because there are so many things that we do that we don't realize the consequences of them until much later on. I could think about um, lead and paint. Um, if you were to buy a house right now, you have to get waivers declaring that there's lead in the paint or all kinds of just sign, all kinds of things. Things like certain medicines that were taken or smoking, whatever it might be. Things that people didn't thought they were just fun or no consequence. And it wasn't until decades went on, generations went on, that they realized what they were doing was they were sowing poison in all of their homes and in their bodies. Sex is, it can be similar to that. <laughs> when used in the wrong way. The feeling is pleasure. It comes and goes in the moment. But what's happening spiritually, emotionally, physically, when used in the wrong ways, that you might not fully grasp and see the consequences of for decades until you find your wife. Or if you're being immoral with your wife, with your 
even if you are being sexually immoral, engaging with the person who you're going to marry, that bears consequences on the marriage you will have in terms of lack of fidelity, lack of being able to trust someone who will adhere to God's word. I mean, all kinds of consequences that you just can't even begin to foresee until they begin to sprout and bear fruit in your life down the road. So it's, it's a hard one because on the surface, what's the harm? Well, according to scripture, according to those who have um, sown into that sin, there is great harm, but you might not know it until much time passes. My just closing thought on that is uh, you mentioned society yeah. and the fact that society today is very, thinks of it as like an old school idea. Uh, doing a, a job with my dad one day, we were working out in a field grinding stumps and uh, we had to get into this other field uh, because we, there was a stump over there and there was a fence in the way. And so I went up to the fence and I was like, well, we'll just take the fence down. I started, you know, putting the pole back and forth, trying to get the pole out of the ground. And, he, and my dad stopped me and said, what, what are you doing? And, and I said, well, well, we just gotta move the fence and then we can get to the thing. He's like, you have no idea why that fence is there. Hmm. I know today, a lot of people have said, this is really stupid, this fence, this law, this rule that says no sex before marriage. But before you move the fence, you gotta ask, why is it there? So why did God put that there? And then the, all of these were the reasons as to why. The reason God put that there is that it is a safety. It is a protection. It is a covenant, mm -hmm. right? There, there are consequences when you move forward. And, uh, and the world experiences those all the time. All right, last question, and we'll be done. Um, I, I thought this was a very fun question. Where's it at? What do Christians have to say about people believing in ghosts and stuff? <laughs> and uh, and this question or Bigfoot, <laughs> or Bigfoot, sure. And this question was courtesy of uh, Mr. Poltergeist. <laughs> what do Christians have to say about believing in ghosts and stuff? Wow, that's our last one. I just got that. <clears throat> Ghost and stuff. <laughs> paints, paints and boogers. Paints, boogers, and boogers. Um, Well, some things are clear in Scripture. Um, very clear. When someone dies, there is not a state where they hover and linger, but they either ascend to be with Christ in paradise, or they descend um, in a way final judgment. Um, so there is no lingering after someone dies. Um, there are yeah, just leave it at that, I guess. Um, that does not mean, though, that we do not live in a world that is um, inhabited and active beyond what we see and engage with our physical, natural senses. Um, this morning we talked about this, this amazing encounter where God um, comes and wrestles in body form with Jacob. We see these moments in Scripture where God peels back the curtain from what is just physical and shows his... Shows his, his um, his people, his angels surrounding him. Um, we see moments in the book of Acts where there are people who seem to have these special powers and abilities, and Paul comes and casts out demons, and those abilities leave. So, um, I don't believe, in Scripture, I don't think encourages us to believe that there are the souls of dead people wandering and inhabiting the world, but it does not mean that the world is not inhabited by a deceiver who is seeking to put fear in people's hearts and minds to deceive them about what is true, um, about God, about eternity, about the spiritual world. So um, I am I am very comfortable with the idea that there are things happening in the world that we can't spend a hard time trying to explain. But I think the explanations we give for those things have to be things that we wrestle with through Scripture. What is true? What is right? What does Scripture allow us? How does it explain the spiritual world? And how does its explanation govern the way we interpret the world around us? I'm sure that covers all the stuff part. <laughs> but maybe that speaks to something. I mean, that's some weird stories I could... But yeah, in Scripture. That, um, that's my general answer, though. I don't know about Bigfoot. But or the monster in your beard. Well, do you really believe that this princess had hair that long that the guy could climb down or climb up her hair to save her? 
What was that? Which, which one was that? Oh, I mean, that's hand stuff. So, so you don't necessarily have to believe in stuff to maybe enjoy the story, right? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so you can enjoy it without actually believing it. What is the, what is the, they made all that series of movies, uh... Ghostbusters? No, the... Uh, the, the magicians and... The, no, or Harry Potter? Yeah, Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry I mean, do you really Potter. believe that that is a true story? Okay. Yep. I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Uh, I'm Anthony Spartan. Awesome. Guys, did you enjoy that? Yeah. That was really good. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much.